So Christian is from uh, Berlin and uh, pastor and president of the Bible School there. And many of you know him from before. Some of you haven't met him before. And uh, yeah, it's a blessing to have you again here. We, you know, you're, you're more than just, uh, even though it says guest preacher, you're more than that. And, and it's good to have you regularly come and be with us here. So uh, please come and share the word of God with us. Thank you. It's a great privilege to be here, obviously, um, from Berlin. And um, just to share with you the word of God. Um, I know it's um, been, I don't know, nearly a year. That was the last time here. And uh, since we come so regularly every year, we, um, we want to make it a habit to at least visit once during this time. Um, yeah, I wanted to focus our attention today on the on P, First Peter chapter one verses six to nine. And um, if you have a Bible, please take it out. If you have something to write, please use that. Um, my intention is really to dig into the Scripture. I've called it um, "Be happy when there's nothing to laugh about." Be happy when there's nothing. To laugh about. And I wanted to read with us the passage um, first. Um, again, it's First Peter chapter one, verses six to nine. I will hope I can cover all of this. How much time do I have? Till one? Was it right? About five o'clock. Oh, good, good. I I I, 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 usually now. I, I, I assumed so much, so that's why. I, you have your pillows there, and yeah, I'm just. Saying. Okay, let's start. In this, you greatly rejoice. So now for a little while, I, if need be, you have been grieved with various trials. That the genuineness of your face being much more precious than gold that is perishing, so it is, the, is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having, whom having not seen, you love, so not, for so now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your face, the salvation of your souls. This is a very important passage, I think, and as the believers were in the diaspora and the uh, fleeing basically the persecution under P during Peter's time, he's talking and he's writing to men and women and families who are under major uh, persecution. But what is important is basically the first verse where he says, in this you greatly rejoice so for now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved with various trials. This whole thing talks about our trials we will have. And I want to make just some foundational comments about what trials we will encounter and why we will encounter trials and how good it is to encounter trials. Because his perspective, Peter's perspective, is it is good to have trials. It's not bad. He says here, um, you uh, be grieved you, by various tribes. You may, um, for a little while, um, you have been grieved by various tribes. He, he assumes you will have the trials. But let me go a, a few verses before chapter uh, verse 3 to 5, where he explains why we can rejoice. And here he said, blessed be the Lord of our Father and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant, abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power 
of God through faith from the salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. So what Paul, Peter makes clear is that our, our future is secured in God. He says by the, that it is by the power of God um, who is kept by the power of God through faith the salvation, salvation ready to be the, the last time. So we know one thing is that our future is secure by the power of God, not by somebody else, by the power of God. And then he says that we will encounter various trials. And he says not only that you will encounter them, but they are necessary. Our trials are necessary. It, it, it doesn't just have to be that way. It maybe have to be that way. It will be that way. It's necessary. You need to encounter various trials. And he also mentioned in this passage, in the beginning, just to introduce this, that these tries are necessary and they will be painful. They will be painful. And there are many other passages which talks about the painfulness of our trials. If you go just to James chapter 1, and in James chapter 1, um, James says, in James 1, verses 2 to 4, he makes very clear that trials are a very necessary part of the life of Christian. My brethren, count it all joy. He, he says it's joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that your testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may not, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So Jacob makes clear that from his perspective, it's, it's a, a necessary aspect of our life is to encounter trials. And those trials will bring us to perfection in Christ. So the main question for us is why does it happen? Why does it happen? Why does it happen today? What does for instance, this whole virus which we encounter, why does it happen? Why do, does God choose to use us for our better? And um, why is it right now that we have to deal with it? Why, may I, why am I right now tried in my patience, in my perseverance? And you know, you might think, okay, yeah, perseverance, it's something that I, I have difficulty dealing with. But, you know, so far it has gone really well for me in my life. Why should I be worried about it? It has gone the next last 10, 20, 30 years well. Why should I worry about that? Is it really so difficult, the whole thing? Can, couldn't I just go through the day and just live like I always lived before, do I have to really refocus my life? But Peter here tries to emphasize to the believers who are in the diaspora, who are fleeing the scene, basically, or going to different countries, different places, where they have not lived before, and, and telling them, you know, this is important. God is using this in your life. And you have to understand why things happen this way. In chapter 2, the same uh, of 1 Peter, he, it's mentioned over and over in different aspects. In chapter 2, verses 21, he talks about it as well. And he says here, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. He talks about suffering here who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, who, who when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. And so on. He goes on, and he makes clear that suffering was part of Christian life, and Christ was an example to that. A little bit later in, in chapter 4, verses 
12 to 19, he talks about this again. He talks about the suffering again. And he said, beloved, do not think it's strange concerning the fiery trials, which is, uh, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, then when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And he talks here again as joy, trials and joy. James said it's also joy. Peter again says here joy. And in verse 19, he says, therefore let us who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him who is doing good as a faithful creator. So he makes sure that we, uh, Peter makes sure that the people understood in that time that trials are part of life. And we see that in the old, old New, New Testament over and over again, that trials are aspect of life we have to deal, deal with. In Hebrews, um, Hebrews 1, Hebrews 12, verse 2, Hebrews explains, the writer from the Hebrews explains how important it is to have our perspective in those trials because he just talked about the men in chapter 11 who were people who suffered for their faith and died for their faith. And in verse 12, he basically sums it up and says what our perspective should be in those kind of situations. And he said in verse 2, for chapter 12, Hebrews 12, Chapter 2, uh, verse 2, he says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he made sure that the people understood that trials are part of life. And he said it's in various trials. So it's not just some one trial he's talking about. but in various trials. God uses various trials in each one of our lives. Now, this pandemic could be used as, well, it's one trial for everybody the same. Well, it's not really true. It affects everybody differently. The trial itself is not the problem. The pandemic is not the problem, but the outcome of the pandemic in somebody's lives could be in many ways. Some people, health problems, financial problems, family problems, whatever. There's so many different things which could happen through them. But our outlook should be to those kind of trials, they are necessary. Why are they necessary? They are necessary because God wants to form us into something very, very special. He wants to form us into something very special. He wants to make us basically, he brings, wants to bring us up to full manhood or womanhood, you could say, something which reflects Jesus Christ in our life. And he uses trials to do that. And he uses trials because only through the trials can we really function as a church and give ourselves and serve ourselves as the gifts he has given us through, um, yeah, to us through the giving of the Holy Spirit. So what, what we, what uh, the various trials could be also translated as multicolored trials, multifaceted trials, multi, so they, they are not the same. But one thing we can understand or know for sure is that we, that the trials are not, never more than we can bear. And Paul talks about that, and I want to make you aware of one passage which I use very often. I'm also at the at the training center teaching biblical counseling. My wife and I do a lot of biblical counseling. And we always make this particular verse um, known to our counselees who are struggling and say, well, it's unbearable. I can't handle it anymore. It's too much. You don't know my marriage, my wife or my husband, how he is so difficult. I can't live with him. All the kids say, you know, you just can't. I have just crazy kids. How can I deal with them? I basically should hire them away, you know, to give them to somebody. I don't, I can't deal with it. And uh, or the pain is too, 
too hard to bear under. But when you then go back, if you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 13, a very familiar place for those ones who do counseling, Paul reminds the believer that there's nothing, not, no uncertainty in God's plan. There's no, no aspect of our trial that is beyond us. And he says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So Paul explains to the Corinthians, look, please understand, yes, it's difficult time. Yes, you have pain. But no, it's not too difficult. It's not too difficult. You can, you go through the trials, yes, but God will provide a way out through this. He will provide a way through this, not out, that goes, it would be wrong. Through the trials to make you what you need to be. And as, as we read in Hebrew, we need to fix our, our view on Jesus Christ. Um, you know, it's, it's, let me a little bit talk about trials a little bit more. When we talk about various colors of trials, what it basically uh, talks about, about multicolor trials, it's like a carpet. And in, in Finland, I know they have the nice woven carpets with different colors. But I know in the Orient, they have huge, very nice Persian or any kind of different carpets done. And they are very often even used to hang on walls. And I have seen many of those uh, because my father had a, 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 had a hotel at the time and they had a lot, everywhere carpets, but also they have the people who sold, sold the carpets had an auction every, or not auction, sales every year at his place. So I saw the carpets and I was, I was a little boy and I ran my cars on them because they had so straight lines. I loved the carpets. They were nice as well. But this, the carpets, when you see the colors being added, you don't understand what it means until you see the whole picture. And this is how God, God works with us. He uses different colors, different trials to make us to this perfect carpet. Of course, we are, not, we are much more than a carpet. It's, it's even much more multifaceted to make us to this Christian person that reflects Christ in, in life. And this is what he wants to, so he wants to explain to the people. And so he said, be happy when you have trials, okay? Can you smile? It is a good time right now. It is a great time. Is it a good time to have the virus, to have the pandemic? It is a good time to have the pandemic. There's no, there's no, it's not a mistake done anywhere. Maybe we make mistakes to deal with it. That's a possibility. But by God, it's not a mistake. I'm not saying that he created that thing in order to make the pandemic, but he allowed it to happen in such a way that it does accomplish something. And so a lot of people say, we'll never get back to normal because it will be something we have to live with. That could be. But he says, in, um, he makes sure that we understand it's something where we should be glad about the trials. Because he says in verse 7 that the genuineness of your face being much more precious than gold and uh, that precious thought, uh, yeah, pre uh, precious than gold, gold, that precious thought is the best uh, tested by fire and so on. He, he makes sure that we are that what he's doing is has a, a goal. He wants, to in, he wants to refine us as gold. And everybody from us probably had how gold is refined, that when it's heated up, and that's a, that's a pressure, that's a trials, the bad stuff comes up to the top, he takes it, it's taken away to clear, clean the, uh, the gold, and he do, does it as much, as often as he needs to, in order to produce a pure, gold or pure things and the gold was so pure that you can use it as a mirror you can look yourself into it and instead of seeing your face 
you should see Christ in it. So should, we should be really thankful when we have um, the trials because they produce genuine genuineness of our faith being produced, which is more precious than gold. And it reflects Christ. It reflects Christ. Christ. And what are the things which have to, God has to get rid of in our life? What do you think what he has to get rid of in our life? Pride? Egoismus? He needs to get rid of all kinds of haughtiness, anger, all these behaviors, unkindness. This is what he wants to bring to the surface. Our relationships of when we don't behave as we should to others, he shows that to us. And this is actually what happens. If you have listened and listened to the news and read all the stuff that happened all around the world, people were pressured into doing things in an ungodly fashion. At least in Germany, the, the tension amongst relationship has grown tremendously. Marriages are under pressure. The training of the kids, there were lots of more mishandling of kind, uh, children and um, a lot of more suicides. All this kind of things came to the surface because they were isolated and the pressure was on. And so we, we need to, he, he wants to really also pressure us or give us his trials in order that things come to the surface which are good. This gold, this precious gold. And, um, and that we may be found to praise, honor, glory as a revelation of Jesus Christ. So it has, its, it has a goal. The goal is really to produce something that is very, very valuable, much more valuable like any material things. You know, also, if you, have you ever asked yourself in this time, in the pandemic, why we as men are so much more concerned about physical life than about the, really the essence of life, the spiritual life, the life with Christ, the life with God. People were, were are willing to give away some very, very precious um, parts of, a, of church life in order to secure their physical life. And um, I've thought about a lot more in the next few weeks. I, uh, next week, actually, I'm, I'm preaching on um, what fellowship really is, what community really is. And uh, I have already started to study through the Old and New Testament. And I'm reading on the other side another book on that because I just wanted to make me aware of it. And it's, the realization for me is that God has given us something much more valuable than our physical life and, the, and, the, and um, even our health is just not so important when you think about the spiritual and, and eternal life and eternal life. So what, what is a picture which we see here? God is refining us through the, through the trials to bring out, you know, things like um, pride, uh, and any dependencies which we should not be dependent on. Um, maybe also unwillingness to learn certain things, maybe rebellion. So maybe something we want to be control of everything. Any other sins which might be coming up to this. So what he really wants to produce is a, a heart that is, um, as the Bible says, it's, 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 it's willingness to admit to its fault, to the sin, and his willingness is willing to, to be transformed 
in the likeness of Christ. Something where we, we, as I mentioned, we look into when we see the gold and it's, it's totally uh, cleaned and, and we see our face, we would not see ourselves. But, I mean, one of the other aspects in my own life is I, I, I realize that I'm not very good in receiving correction. It's not very, I'm not very good in dealing with trials. Sometimes God has to do it many, many times in order to bring to, to the surface what needs to be taken away or what needs to come to the surface as, as a pure and um, as purity in my own life as reflecting Christ in my own life. And so that, this is something which is just a normal uh, uh, occurrence. My question is, is this the same with you guys? Is this the same? Do you have this? I mean, I assume Finland is no different than Germany. Well, it's, it might be smaller, it might be hotter than other places, but no, it's not. I mean, and, and understand that, that, you know, the issues with the people is the same, I think. We have all the same. We, we love the world too much, very often. We love our own lives too much. We love our, yeah, our own too often too much. Even, we might be even just focused on our family and say, my family is everything. But instead, we should look to Christ and say, he is everything. And if he has given me children and a husband and a wife, and that is a gift from him, I can work. I can live as it to, the, to his glory. If I, he has given me work, then I do the work to the glory of God. If I go to school, then I teach, study or teach to the glory of God. Whatever my role is, I do it to the glory of God. And I will be refined in the time um, in that God has given me. But how does God refine us? How does God refine us? How will he refine us? He said, yeah, with various, various trials, but that doesn't, trials not necessarily are the, the end means of what he's doing, but he wants to make sure that we, that we, um, what we also teach in biblical counseling, that we put off the wrong and put on the right things during our trials. That means we are not, we are not going into ourselves and looking for the right thing in us, but we look to Christ and God for the right things. And, and he says also that will be our future, um, our future blessing will be eternal life, not the life here on earth. But let me, see, let me ask you again, what is it, what makes you, or uh, what can refine you? If you get trials and don't know where you have to go to, if you don't have a standard by where to live by, what does a trial help you? It would be just discouraging you and would be just putting you down. And, uh, and for some, I hope, if that's the case, they ask themselves, for what do I live? Why do I live? What is the goal of my life? But let's look at Psalm 19, what he talks about the trials, how we could answer to trials in life. And David at the time, and I'm not saying that he is in trials, but he understands where he goes to when he wants to have the truth, when he wants to know what's right. In Psalm 19, verses 8, he says, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. He says, if you want to be after rejoicing your heart, go to the scripture. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. Pure, what he means is here, if you want to have clarity in your life, why things are happening, go to scripture. Look at the scripture, study the word of God, memorize the word of God, meditate on the word of God. Do it. Or the, for verse nine, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. He says, this is eternal, this is standing. You don't have to, it doesn't change tomorrow. All the different news we hear today, I mean, it's every time, every day there's something else. You don't know what you can believe right now. I mean, I, I listen generally to four or five news agents, Israel, American, German, and different ones. I know they are left, right, whatever. I don't care. But in, in, in the middle, you see somewhere there must be something right. 
but sometimes we really think, I don't understand what they are saying. That's everybody contradicts the other, the next one. But here he says, God's word is not contradictory. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true, the true, and he, he means he means true, and rejoicing altogether. So, so he, he understands that when I when God wants to refine us, change us, he puts pressure on us and he wants us to turn to the scripture to find the right way to go by scripture, not by anything else. If you would go to, um, and I, I use on purpose a few more scripture today, but if you go to 2 Timothy, there's a passage which um, most of us know, 2 Timothy 3, and that's the New Testament, Paul's answer to the question, where do I know truth from? What is my guide? What do I use for guidance in my life? And he says, all scriptures given by inspiration by of God. So he says, it's from God. It's not my scripture. It's not Paul's scripture. It's not David's or it's not Peter's or anybody's scripture. It's from God. All inspiration is given is given by inspiration by God and is profitable for doctrine. So that means it's clear teaching for reproof. To correct uh, for reproof as to say, show that somebody is wrong, for correction to correct that what is shown to be wrong, for instruction in righteousness, not instruction for car building, that's not the thing, but for righteousness, what is right in this world. That the man, and that means man and woman, of God may be completed, thoroughly, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every good work, not some good work, every good work. So the pressure we get through the trials should turn us to God, should turn us to a scripture, should turn to the word of God. And, and then he says, when that happens, when we are refined and it, it is, it, it turns out that it develops glory he says in verse um, verse eight uh, on the second part of um, verse seven may be found praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it produces praise and glory from us also, but also far us through us through Jesus Christ. It is it is something that it brings something good. So you understand now trials are good because they sh if we respond in the right way to them and let them refine us and we turn to the word of God and put off the old part, the sinful attitudes, the sinful thoughts, the sinful behaviors and replace them with the right ones, the word of God, then they will produce honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's interesting there's not physical things talked about. It's all spiritual. Life is, for us, is mainly spiritual. You know, our eternal life, we are living already our eternal life now. We are in the process of it. I'm not saying that we don't disregard the physical life, but the physical life really is in order to give honor to God, reflect Jesus Christ in our life, and bring on and bring glory and honor because of Jesus Christ working through us. So that is something what I, it's amazing. He wants to use it. Has anybody worked with, worked with um, any workplace or did a, a job with having the wrong tools? Have you tried to cut down a tree with a saw that has no uh, what do you say, no teeth on them? It's senseless. You, you might as well push against the tree and hope that you can be so heavy and weigh it down until it falls. It doesn't work. And if you have a sharp saw, it's fun. You go and you, oh, and the, you know, the, the sawdust is flying and the tree can be moved. And especially we, have, we do that in Finland every year when we come to the 
our uh, summer uh, home from my mother's side, then we, there are always trees to be cut down because they, they just overgrow our property and you can't see the water or you can't see your own house because it's growing so fast here. And so you want to have a good saw. You want to have a good tool. I'm a, I'm a cook. No, not anymore, but I love food, so I do cook. But if you have a knife, you want to cut onions and it doesn't cut or tomatoes, say, instead of that they cut them, they squeeze up and you know, spray in your face. You don't like that. I mean, you wouldn't want that. A, good, a, a housewife wants to have good tools and that's why I invested always in good tools because then I know that I have you know, clothes, good food. <laughs> and, and I, I, yeah, I want to give my wife good tools and for the kitchen, for the housework. And then the same thing, I want to have good tools and my tool, is a scripture and only the scripture and I try to study the Bible as much as I can so you want to use good tools and God has given us good tools in the scripture and he has given us a good tool it's actually the trials because the way it is written here in the Greek it says it is multicolored trials they are they will be there they are not just for some, they're for every Christian. What a multicolored trials are just for every Christian. And I, I, me I mentioned that this pandemic has not only caused health issues for some, or for many, I shouldn't say, not for some. My son-in-law who's preaching next week, he had COVID-19 and it was difficult, but he's long over it. And none of his family members got it. No, they're all tested positive, uh, negative. You say positive is when you have it, right? Negative. So, but what tries it, financial? You, some of us couldn't finish their studies because they were the on, university didn't go online. We had quite a few, and you think about it: you a whole half year, you lose a whole half year, and you have no job in that time. It's very difficult. Your household, well, one thing I, yeah, household, and there are many other things between, as I mentioned, between um, couples, there's often tension, and all those kind of things came up. So we should be happy about them, but we should be also happy about them because they reveal Christ in our own life. Trials reveal Christ in our own life, or the opposite, that we have to work on it. And if you know Christ well, and if the trials have good fruit in your life, they will produce um, Christ likeness in your, in your relationship to your wife or husband. Christ likeness in your relationship to your husband. It will reveal in parents an attitude of discipleship in Christ. Because our highest goal as parents is to reach our kids with the gospel, but not only with the gospel, also to model Christ for them. It will produce it produces just in our churches, it will produce that people want to serve each other, the one another. It will, it will bring us back to, and I saw that, people want to be together. It's not enough to watch Zoom. It's nice to watch Zoom. I know it's better than nothing. But to be together physically, to hug each other, to, I mean, that's not why, I, but to say, to talk to one face to face, to, to cry with somebody, to, to love with somebody, it's important. Just last week there, uh, last, the week before, three people died in our uh, surrounding, two, pair, two fathers from church members and one, um, one wife, uh, uh, one mother of one of missionaries who I'm uh, caring for. And I realized 
you know, they are desperate to spend time with them and now those people are gone. I know the young man, he was crying and said, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have at the time. And, and, and it's, it's done. This, his father died without Christ. The others, they were Christians. So, so it will produce it. It also will produce an urge for sharing the truth with the other people. You want to share the truth. You want to go out and reach the people. You want to preach the gospel, so to speak. And it should produce us actually in us a Christ-like love for the others. And this is always sacrificial, giving instead of receiving. It's always sacrificial. Jesus Christ has actually, uh, uh, Paul warned the believers in Corinth that if they don't uh, love Christ-like, it's an anathema. It's, a, it's, it's really a very bad thing. He said, we should, because this is our goal, we should be seen by the love for one another as Christians. And in, in, in chapter 16, 1 Corinthians 16, 22, he says, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be a curse. O Lord, come. So to not love Christ and to love, not love the others, it is not good. So how am I doing? How are, how are you doing? How are you doing in those aspects? Do you believe in Christ? Do you believe in Christ? And when I'm asking, yes, of course I believe in Christ, what the scripture says. Well, let me go on. Let me go on. If you believe in Christ, do you, when he talk, says in the word something you should do, are you doing it? When he says, love one another, do you love one another? If you believe in Christ, that's what you would do. If you see somebody sinning, are you so loving to, to lovingly help them to see the sin and help them long? If you see in the scripture that he's giving you, um, he's making a promise to you, do you, do you trust him? Do you trust Christ when in his word it says there is a promise? And it's very clear, this, you know, you will have eternal life. Do you trust him? When he wants to give you hope, are you, are you hopeful? Are you hopeful? If the word of God is leading you, are you following? Are you following? Because this is what he says, L listen to this. We having not seen you love, you have not seen Jesus Christ, but you love him. So now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy, inacceptable and full of glory. You know, right, we don't see Christ, right? But we, he reveals himself to us. And the question is, are we, Trusting God's word. And I tell you, right now, this is the most important thing you need to trust. It's God's word in this time and the time to come. It will not get better in this world. The scripture is very clear that times, the difficult times, when they come, they are so severe, everybody will know that God is acting here. That's not us. It's not man who would make the mistake or somebody, or that is a virus or pandemic. No. It will be so severe and there's only the people who can really deal with it will be those ones who trust when God speaks. Trust when God speaks. Yeah. So we, we, we are not people who live by feelings. But we believe we, we live by the truth, by what we know from God's scripture, 
And that's why it's so important to study God's word. Um, if I would be live by feelings, I would have probably, it's not, I mean, like a mother, does she feel always good with her kids? I mean, when they have dirty diapers, does that feel good? No, I don't think so. When they cry, does it feel good? No, no. When you have to get up at three o'clock in the morning because they're awake, that doesn't feel good. Does it feel good for a husband to go to work and work 10 hours a day and um, sometimes get, you know, not being even respected by the co-workers? But he knows that's right to do because I want to provide for my family. I want to do what's right in the eyes of God, in the eyes of the family. So if you want to believe Christ, then you should also follow him and, and work and do according to what he says. And then he says, and this is... He talks about this again, receiving the, um, the second part of verse 8. Yet, believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory. Okay, let me talk a little bit about joy. How is your joy? How is our joy when, we talk, when it comes to Jesus Christ? Unexpressible joy. It's something are we really understanding that in this difficult circumstances, Peter is writing to the people who are the Christians who are persecuted, who are running away, who are in different countries, different places. Nobody wants them. They've lost how, uh, home. They lost the uh, sometimes loved ones and everything. And he says, he says here, you rejoice. And not only rejoice, inexpressible, full of glory. Why is that? Because he says, remember who you focus on, but show that to the people. We are right now the only people that give hope in this time of the, of the time, in this time, in the whole world. We are the ones who live by hope, by this because the inner rejoicing in what God has done for us. And will people see that in you? Because your trials and your difficulties are just a short time. They are just a short time compared to the glories to be received. Because we focus in on the last part of it, receiving the end of your face, the salvation of your soul. So he, this is very interesting what Peter does here. He gives a synopsis of what we are going through, what the people at that time went through, and that is essentially what we also deal with. He talks about how we should respond to difficulties, to, to multicolored trials, and he says, we can because we could watch, we look to Christ, but we look also to the salvation to be revealed to us. That what is, it's, it will be revealed, it's, but it's already factual. That means we are already saved. We have that already, but we can hold on to that. That means in every trial you have in this days, any trial, any kind of the multicolored trials, you look and you know, I am eternally saved. And actually, the trials just show that you are saved, because the fruit will make sure, uh, will, will come to, to the fruition, will show either something has to be put away, and then you cleanse and you learn from it. And sometimes it takes more time. But God, you, you understand that God is in, on work with each one of us in such a way he wants to make us the most um, colorful carpet or the most uh, precious gold or the most refined um, stone that is cut in a perfect way to reflect 
Christ in our life. That is where he wants to bring us to. Well, I have a short illustration. There was a pastor um, who had, um, who nearly died because he had a blood clot in uh, his veins and he wanted, he, he nearly died and it, uh, and he was uh, hurried to the ECU and every, uh, to the I, I, what do you call it, ICU, whatever, to the intensive care unit. Then and came and then next morning he heard a knocking at the store in the hospital. And here comes his good friend and says, hello. And he was totally discouraged. He was totally discouraged. He asked himself, and the other guy said, why are you discouraged? I said, I thought I would meet my maker, but now I see you again. <laughs> so this is the aspect we, how we deal with life right now. We should, yes, we are here. We do everything we can to make life worse while living for everybody else. But our focus will always be on Christ and always on eternity. Always on eternity. I would like to end with a verse out of first Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter three verses one and following. And here Paul writes to the Colossians um, the following. If then you were raised with Christ, Seek, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, si is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on earth. For you died, and you live, your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on earth and then he lists the whole thing. Paul had the same view as Peter, James and the others. We are already in Christ. We are already there where we should be. Positionally in Christ. But as long as we are here, we have to put to death all the filthiness of our, of our, I shouldn't say common life, but all the filthiness of what hinders us to glorify God and reflect Christ in our lives. Let me pray. Father God, we are indeed grateful for your goodness, your kindness to us. We are indeed happy to, be know, to know that you have given us eternal life, that you sit at the right hand of God and that you intercede for us and that it's not dependent on us, but it's all dependent on you. And, and yet you have given us the strength to fight sin. And, and you have given us the strength to sacrificially love and, and, and be um, really spent for your glory. And I, I pray really for e each one who's here today that you work in each one's life in such a way that we become... Um, we, come, we, we really become kind of uh, medals of glory um, shown um, to the people around our area and where we live and even our family. And uh, I'm very grateful for your goodness to here in Finland for your church. Uh, ask your blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen.